Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll give it one more minute before I begin. Yeah, it looks like we've got a few more people joining, so I'm going to give it another minute. I'm not sure you all have access to the chat box, but could someone put in the chat or the Q&A whether or not you're seeing my slides, if that's possible? That'd be awesome. OK, awesome. Thank you very much. Great. Well, it looks like the numbers have stabilized. I'm going to go ahead and go off camera for now. Um, and we'll go ahead and walk through the presentation and then open it up for questions. So um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're located. My name is Britt Parker, and I am with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. And today we're offering this webinar to discuss the letter of intent feedback generally that was given on uh, those letters of intent we received for the Climate Program Office, FY24, NIDAS, Federal Funding Opportunity, Tribal Drought Resilience with IRA Support. So uh, briefly today, I want to just go back over some of the requirements related to this competition. Then we'll review the LOI review process. We'll look at the LOIs kind of by the numbers so that you see how many LOIs we received. We'll dig in a bit more on the general feedback and then I'll open it up for questions before I do a brief overview of the full proposal uh, process and requirements. And then again, I'll offer a bit of a Q&A session. Um, given the way this uh, webinar is set up, uh, you will need to use the question box, which should be on your control panel uh, to ask questions. So please feel free to put questions in that question box at any time, and I'll go through them um, at various points in the presentation. So just a reminder that this particular competition is focused on uh, providing support for tribal nations to implement activities that address current and future drought risk on tribal lands across the West. And we'll look in a minute at how the West is defined in this situation uh, in the context of a changing climate. And we included a broad list of uh, what types of activities uh, are included uh, within this funding opportunity, but I want to uh, reiterate that the activities aren't limited to what's on this list. This is just meant to provide uh, some examples. So identifying primary drought impacts, identifying optimal drought indicators or triggers, uh, developing a drought communication or information dissemination plan, improving or enhancing drought monitoring, developing online dashboards with relevant drought tools and information, conducting a drought vulnerability assessment, developing a drought plan, convening workshops with key partners within the tribe or, and or external to the tribe to increase communication and sharing of drought information, and demonstrating the application of drought data and information to enhance decision making. So those are just um, you know, examples of what you might propose to do under this uh, funding opportunity. Um, I do want to focus in on uh, how we define the West for the purposes of this competition. Um, and so this is considered to be the areas within the five uh, National Integrated Drought Information System uh, drought early warning system. So that's everything that is west of or to uh, the left of the line on the map. So that incl includes California, Nevada, the Intermountain West, the Missouri River Basin, the Pacific Northwest, and the Southern Plains. So those are the geographical areas that are eligible for the competition. 
I want to very briefly go over um, the guidelines that were provided for applicants um, specifically because that's what we were really looking at when we looked at the LOIs that were submitted. And so the requirements, the proposal will language in the notice of federal funding opportunity included that proposals will demonstrate full partnership of tribal nations. If the primary applicant is not a tribal nation, then full partnership with a tribal nation can be demonstrated by including at least one full investigator on the project representing a federally recognized tribe and or indicating through the budget and the budget justification that funds are being disseminated to the tribe as part of the, uh, the work. And so we really, um, are requiring that tribal nations be full partners within uh, any proposal or project that is funded. Um, we also want to see that um, you've demonstrated an integrated project team with or considering partners from public and private sectors, academia to include tribal colleges and universities, uh, local, regional, tribal, and federal governmental agencies, non-governmental uh, organizations, environmental groups. This could include intertribal councils and consortia, tribal uh, LRT organizations, citizen groups, etc. And so this is, you know, of course, as appropriate, but we, we do want to see these integrated project teams, especially um, where it's um, desirable and, and we should see, um, again, tribal partners. Proposals will demonstrate adherence to the guiding principles of tribal engagement as defined in NIDIS's tribal engagement strategy, um, which include respecting tribal sovereignty, ensuring trust and reciprocity, and ensuring drought-related work is culturally appropriate and useful for tribal nations. Um, and when we get to the Q&A session, I will put a bunch of links in the chat box to include a link to this document. As part of the description of project activities, um, we ask that you provide detailed information on activities to be conducted, locations, sites, timelines, um, species and habitat that may be affected, possible construction activities, and any environmental concerns that may exist, as we must analyze the potential environmental impacts as required by the National Environmental Policy Act. So this really applies to um, those projects where um, we say dirt will be disturbed on the ground. So anything that has an impact um, to the environment, and uh, in this case, especially to um, tribal lands to cultural resources, et cetera. And we'll go into that a bit more through some of the feedback. Um, and then we included a number of uh, language around proposals may. And so this isn't a hard requirement, but uh, projects are really encouraged to demonstrate external contributions, um, in-kind uh, contributions or funding to be leveraged with these federal research funds, though I wanna stress that there is no match or cost share requirement for this particular funding opportunity. Um, leveraging previous or ongoing work related to climate and drought vulnerability assessments and planning, such as those funded under the BIA Tribal Resilience Grants or the Department of Interior Climate Adaptation Science Centers, et cetera. Um, we just you know, love to see um, work building on the foundation of previous work or integrated into um, you know, ongoing work and projects. And finally, um, proposals may demonstrate a partnership with tribal colleges and universities to enhance collaboration and utilize the valuable resources that TCUs have to offer in terms of faculty, staff, students, and facilities. Um, so once LOIs or letters of intent were received, um, we asked reviewers to assess LOIs consistent with the funding announcement. And specifically, we were looking at um, those requirements that I just went over. And so each LOI was reviewed by two to three people well-versed in the purpose and scope of the funding announcement. And if you received feedback, that means that one or more of the reviewers who reviewed your LOI thought that it was potentially deficient or simply could be strengthened um, in an area identified in the announcement. And I do want to stress that we understand that the letter of intent is a very short document um, and that, you know, on the timeline to develop letters of intent, you may not have had the opportunity to fully flesh out things like partnerships, 
um, and who would be involved with the work, et cetera. So we understand that. So this was just, you know, trying to give indication of where you might want to spend a bit more time as you develop the full proposal. Um, this was not a review of quality of the proposed idea. So this is simply a review focused on the fit or scope of the idea relative to the funding announcement. Um, a review of you know, technical merit, quality, et cetera, will be done once the full proposals are received. So um, each letter of intent incur uh, received one of the following four recommendations. Um, and I apologize, I know there was um, language in the feedback uh, letter where sometimes we use strongly encouraged or strongly discouraged and elsewhere we used encouraged or discouraged. And so um, my apologies, that was holdover from um, a template I used from our last competition. I thought I caught all the differences, but we moved to simply encouraged or discouraged. So if you got, um, so strongly encouraged and encouraged mean the same thing. Um, so my apologies uh, for that mistake. But the four recommendations were encouraged, encouraged with modifications, discouraged without major modifications, or simply discouraged. Um, and really that, um, those were assigned based on you know, um, if you're encouraged, then we felt like you really hit on all of the requirements. Encouraged with modifications usually means that we felt that, you know, one of the pieces of the puzzle could be strengthened. Um, discouraged without major modifications meant that, you know, there was potentially multiple requirements that hadn't been met. And discouraged was usually given um, if, um, you know, some of the minimum requirements hadn't been met for things like uh, geographical eligibility or uh, budget. So that's how those were determined. So I just wanna go through um, kind of how many letters of intent we got. Um, the, so the total funds, as a reminder, anticipated for these three-year projects is $2.1 million total. Um, we anticipate awarding between three to five projects, depending on the budgets of the successful projects with funding up to $700,000 total. This would be disseminated in year one and expended over three years through cooperative agreements. So we did receive 22 letters of intent. We encouraged 15 of those. Uh, four were encouraged with modifications. Uh, one was discouraged without major modifications and two were discouraged. Um, and so a to the total requested budget of all 22 LOIs was 11 million, um, about $11.7 million. Um, that just kind of gives you an idea of what we received. Um, I do want to stress that no matter what feedback you got, it is at your discretion whether or not you put in a full proposal. So this uh, process is really to help you modify your ideas and your uh, your proposal coming in as a full proposal so that we have stronger fit to the competition. Um, so even if you were discouraged uh, from putting in a full proposal, um, you can still decide to put in a full proposal uh, so and address the deficiencies um, in that were in the letter of intent. So I just want to um, really um, highlight that it is the decision of uh, the PI, whether or not they want to move forward with a full proposal. So let's go over briefly um, the feedback generally that was provided. Um, so I think the first one um, really pertains to the, um, you know, one of the top priorities of this competition, and that is that we really need to see that demonstration of full partnership with tribal nations. This is um, 100 percent geared towards building resilience of tribal nations and so um, w w if especially if the proposal is not led by a tribal nation we need to see that um, your tribal partners are fully engaged from the beginning um, and that you've got partners involved as primary investigators um, and that um, you know through the budget and budget justification that funds are being disseminated. Um, I we have a, a few um, proposals that came in that involve um, you know um, 
organizations with multiple tribes represented, um, with those tribal governments um, having um, committed to um, those tribal organizations, and, and that's fine. Um, but we can't stress enough how important this piece of feedback and this uh, qualification is. Um, number two, there sometimes was feedback about the integrated project team and perhaps um, you know, just encouraging uh, the applicant to consider where appropriate broader representations from partners within the scope of work. Um, again, you know, for the most part, I think that all of the LOIs really demonstrated adherence to the guiding principles of tribal engagement as defined by our engagement strategy, which was um, developed in partnership with tribal governments. Um, but I know that feedback was provided on a couple LOIs, is just making sure that it is very clear in the full proposal um, that these guiding principles are being met. Um, and then if the project appeared that, you know, there would be some construction, there would be installation of stations or anything else that um, that would disturb um, you know kind of dirt <laughs> to say it simply we did just highlight the requirement um, for all the information we would need to at least begin to analyze the potential environmental impacts um, this is usually pretty straightforward um, for the stuff that we fund um, and this was just a reminder we didn't expect this information to be in the LOI um, in addition, if the proposal, uh, the, excuse me, the letter of intent talked about installing um, long-term monitoring stations, we just included a bit of feedback to, um, to talk about the long-term plan for maintenance and operations of any monitoring stations in the full proposal. Again, we didn't expect to see that in the letter of intent. It's just a, a reminder that that is something we would love to see in the full proposal. Um, so again, I can't stress enough, I'm going to say it again, if the project is not tribally led, I think one of the key questions that you want to ask yourself in developing the full proposal is, are you working in full partnership with a federally recognized tribal entity? And do you have a fully integrated project team with funds and resources flowing to those partners? Um, the other piece of feedback we got from a lot of the reviewers was, really ensure that your budget is commiserate with the work to be done um, and really consider that cost will increase between the time of the proposal and the start date of the project which is not until september 1 of next year 2024 um, so you know we don't want to see um you know hugely padded budget overestimating the work to be done but we really also don't want to see you underestimating your budget. And that was something that based on some of the work that was listed in the letters of intent, some of our reviewers felt that the budget might be a little low to actually achieve the goals of the project. Um, other things to consider generally, um, when you're specifying an authorized representative in your grant application, just be aware that if the application is successful, that this person will be required to access, access the grant management um, system and sign for the grant. So just ensure that this person will be available to complete the task. Um, and we also expect um, every grant applicant to work within the governance structure of the federally recognized tribe that um, is that they represent or that they are working with. So if things like you need tribal council approval, um, that you need um, to involve the tribal historic preservation officer, get cultural approval, work through a tribal IRB process, we expect to see that um, in the full proposal. And if the approval has been granted, then you're welcome to um, upload that documentation along with any letters of support. So there'll be room in the system for you to upload um, you know, that, that type of documentation. If it is appropriate for approval to be sought once the application is successful, just include that information in the narrative that you do plan on going through those appropriate processes. And these are only a few. Um, so, you know, but, it can include anything that is required within um, the context of the tribe that you represent or are working with. But I just wanted to stress that. So at this point, 
I'm going to open it up for any questions. Um, and I, you know, we, we're not going to react to specific, you know, project ideas and merit. Um, but I will say now, and I'll say again towards the end, that um, I'm also available for short meetings with the, the grant application teams. And so we'll talk about how to um, schedule those, but I am happy to have, you know, one-on-one -on -one discussions if um, you still have questions after today. So the first question is, if we received an encouraged, but upon revision, believe we may need more funding within the funding limits, will that hurt our application um, in the final submission? No. So um, at the LOI stage, we ask you for a budget estimate. But um, if you are, as long as you're under, you know, at or under that minimum, sorry, that maximum of $700,000, um, then you are welcome within that range to adjust your budget because we understand that um, as you develop the full proposal, you're going to obviously think through more the partnerships, the work, and what's needed to do the work. So let's say you put forward an LOI with a budget of 200,000 and you come in with a full proposal of 400,000, that is not a problem. Um, also, we got our letter for that recommendation but saw no other notes. Was there separate missing um, attachment with feedback? Um, I will look, can you drop in, I have your name. Um, if you will shoot me an email at brit.parker at noaa.gov, I will triple check your letter and see um, what feedback may be missing from that letter. So just please reach out to me and um, we'll, we'll troubleshoot that for you. Uh, let's see, can you talk about ideally what the breakdown of funds should look like? Ari, how much goes to the tribe versus non-tribal partners? Um, for example, can funds go to travel costs for academic partners to do in-person workshops with the tribe? Um, so, yes. Um, I can talk about that breakdown and I'm going to give a really unsatisfactory answer of it depends. Um, so I think that in past competitions, it's been pretty obvious to our review panels when the tribal partners were fully involved and it was a true partnership versus when an applicant perhaps didn't have those relationships and um, and there wasn't that true partnership. And so there is no magic number or percentage because I think that depending on the needs of the tribe, um, it could be very different. Um, and you know, perhaps in some cases it's best for most of the money to go to um, a, a, a non-tribal partner um, you know, for ease of implementing those funds. Um, and I'm happy to talk more with you, you know, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but I, I don't think there is a magic number. We just really need to see that the tribal partners are key and completely invo involved at, in all aspects of the project from beginning to end. Um, but certainly funds can go to travel costs for academic partners, um, you know, we're not asking that a majority of funds go to a tribal partner necessarily. I mean, I think that is really going to be dependent on um, on the actual project and the partners involved. Um, the next question is, were these LOIs already responded to and how do you know if you were selected to write a full proposal? So yes, um, if you submitted an LOI, then we have responded to you and provided feedback. Um, based on that feedback, um, you are welcome to write a full proposal, whether or not we encouraged you to do so. So again, this was just meant to try to help um, really target the full proposals, um, but the, um, the decision to submit a full proposal is fully in the hands of the applicant. I will also say that if you did not submit a letter of intent 
you are still able to write a full proposal and submit a full proposal. So an LOI was not a requirement, though we highly encouraged it. And if you submitted an LOI and did not hear from me, please reach out to me because we'll figure out what happened. So um, if you submitted an LOI and did not get a response, please let me know. Do you fund construction cost? Um, so traditionally our program would not uh, necessarily fund construction costs, but given that these are Inflation Reduction Act dollars, um, that is um, what we fund is, is kind of blown wide open. So if, um, if there are construction costs um, associated with the project and the project will build, um, resilience to drought in a changing climate, then yes, we will um, consider construction costs uh, within the budget. Is a tribal resolution required with submission? So again, I go back to, we expect all applicants to adhere to the governance structure, the, you know, the context and the requirements of the tribal government with which they are working. So, um, if you are working with tribal partners, then um, you know that would be one of the first questions I would you know be working on with the tribal partners. Is is a tribal resolution required to do the work? And if so, then yes, um, we want to see that with the submission, or that that's in process, um, and work you know with you on that to make sure that everything is in place before any work begins uh, and the same for a tribally led project i mean many times a tribal resolution is required for that as well so um that is something that we will want you to work with the tribal government um on um to justify the partnership with tribal communities is it sufficient to include an extension university faculty who works directly on tribal lands um no, um, we really need to see that you have um, a tribal partner representing a federally recognized tribal government or institution as part of the project team. Um, so it's great to have university faculty who are working directly on tribal lands who have those tribal partnerships. Um, but in this case, um, we really want to see that full partnership demonstrated by actually having um, tribal partners um, representing those federally recognized tribes. Okay, I'm going to pause for another minute to see if there's any other questions or follow-up questions. Um, and again, I would encourage you to reach out to me if you would like some one-on-one -on -one time. I'm going to offer that um, over the course of next week in kind of 15-minute increments. Um, and so we'll talk a bit more about that, but please, please reach out because um, we would love to, to talk to you now um, and, and not wait until a full proposal comes in um, and we can't really talk until the competition's over. So please do feel free to reach out if you have follow-up questions. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go to the next slide and just talk through again briefly the requirements for the full proposals. Um, and then after I do that, I'll open it back up for questions again. But you know, before I do that, let me put a bunch of links in the chat box. Um, let's see. Okay, so let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So full proposals, full applications are due by 11.59 p.m. Eastern, I'm gonna stress Eastern time, um, on February 15th, 2024. So remember that Eastern time on the deadline of 11.59 p.m. Um, please make sure that you read the funding opportunity carefully as failure to comply with any of the provisions will result in applications being returned without review. And so this year we've developed, um, there's an information sheet which pulls out some of the most important information. We also have an applicant checklist to ensure that all the components of the full proposal have been submitted. Um, we really encourage you to submit before the deadline with enough time to go back into the system and make sure that everything you uploaded has uploaded correctly. Um, but we want to provide these resources because there's nothing worse than an incomplete proposal which we can't review. So um, 
and again, if you if you have any questions on this or are struggling at all as the deadline approaches, um, please reach out to me. Um, but do not wait to the last minute and don't wait to the last minute to make sure that you have access to the system, that your, um, your institution or your agency has access uh, to the, uh, the grants online portal uh, to get those applications in because sometimes that can take a fair bit of time. Um, if you are a federal agency's, agency who is applying or if you have a federal partner who is applying, please reach out to me as well so we can talk through that process. Oops. Um, so the components of a full proposal include a title page, a one-page abstract, the project narrative with any associated figures and references, and that project narrative is not to exceed 15 pages, though if you have three or more primary investigators, um, that can be up to 20 pages of the full uh, proposal. Um, we want to see results from prior research. Um, if that is applicable, uh, that should not exceed two pages. Um, curriculum vitaes or resumes for all of the PIs. Um, current and pending support if you are receiving federal funding from um, the federal government or state government or other um, types of federal grant funding, um, we, we would like to see um, you know what those projects are um, and obviously that that's related to this competition it's not everything but it's anything that's related to um, this particular competition and what you're proposing um, there should be a data and information sharing plan a statement of diversity of an, and inclusion and budget table and narrative justification and what should be included in each of these is um, fully explained in the notice of federal funding um, and again, we have the applicant checklist to help you ensure that all required components have been submitted. And that was one of the links I put into the chat box. Um, there's also a number of appendices or budget forms, et cetera, that are required but are not counted in the page limits I talked about in the previous page. And those include an indirect cost rate agreement, federal budget forms, the SF-424 and 424A, um, assurances of not for non-construction programs, that's 424B, um, certification requiring lobbying, uh, the CD-511, and then letters of support. Letters of support are not required, um, but um, encouraged if they do more fully explain some of the partnerships you're engaging with. Um, and the other thing that I would say, oh, I want to reiterate, is it's in that same area with letters of support that you can upload um, any sort of tribal resolution or documentation that you've gone through um, proper uh, protocols there. Um, once we receive the applications, um, the first step will be an administrative review to make sure that um, the applicant is eligible, um, it, in, it's within the geography of the competition and that the proposal is complete. Um, in step two, um, the independent, there'll be an independent panel for technical review. Um, their scores uh, are weighted at 60% of the final total score. Um, and any projects that score three or above will move forward to an independent panel for importance and relevance and applicability review. Um, and that will have a final weight of 40% in the final score. Um, all of what goes into these technical and relevance reviews are um, articulated in the notice of federal funding. So you can see what we'll be looking for um, under each of those. Um, pieces of information um, or to inform those panel reviews. So I just want to quickly remind everyone where to find information um, on this funding opportunity. And this includes um, you know, information sheets, the NOFO, the recording of this webinar will be there, as well as the previous webinar we held more generally on the competition. But that is 
um, the Climate Program Office, cpo.noaa.gov, under funding opportunities. Um, I think the NIDAS funding opportunity is currently the second one in the list. If you click on that, um, it will open up a page with a, a lot more information um, and you can click through. If you ever have trouble finding any information, again, please reach out to me at any time. We also have information on the competition on drought.gov on our website, uh, NIDAS's website. But again, that notice of federal funding opportunity is going to be um, the, the, the most important document um, that, that you need to look at and, and read through. Um, again, just <laughs> um, these links again, which I put in the chat box. Um, and if you've missed any of them, again, please email me. And with that, um, I'm going to open it back up for any additional questions at this time. Um, I, but before I do, I'm sorry, if you would love to have a 15-minute discussion with me on, you know, any further questions on LOI feedback, on the competition itself, um, I have a fair bit of time on my calendar next week, um, and I am offering 15-minute time slots if you will email me brit.parker at noaa.gov with your availability. I'll get that set up. Um, if for some reason you and your team can't meet next week, um, then we can certainly find some time in the future, but I would love to schedule those sooner than later so that you can um, inform discussions around the full proposal development. So I'm going to look at the question box for any additional questions. Um, yes, yeah, so um, no problem. So the question is, is it possible to set up a meeting with you in January instead of December? The tribe we are partnered with is observing important ceremonial and religious holidays now. And yes, of course, um, just email me and we'll get that set up. But I'm happy to set something up in January as well. Um, what if we don't have an indirect cost rate agreement? Is there a default indirect rate to use? Yes, um, I can. If you will email me, um, I will direct you to that information. I think it's in the NOFO, but I'm happy to make sure and help you find that information. So do please feel free to follow up with an email. On statement of diversity and inclusion, are, um, as we are a joint partnership of two federally recognized tribes, is that sufficient as we are developing our own nation's drought resilience and, ca and capacity? Or are we expected to include other partners with the understanding that we already intend to share and publish the projects, lessons learned, data, and outputs to be utilized by other tribal nations, of course, adhering to internal tribal data sovereignty protocols. Yes. So um, that diversity um, and inclusion statement is, um, you know, its applicability to this competition is interesting um, in terms of uh, the applicant. So it is a required piece, but it is fine for you to explain exactly what you've explained here um, to me in terms of what you enter into that. So, um, you know, we can talk more about that offline, but if you are a tribal nation that is applying, um, you know, I think that just stating that um, and that, you know, in this case, you're working with multiple tribes is, is fine. And, you're not necessarily expected to include other partners. Um, if a tribal nation is applying for the grant and feel that they have full capacity um, within the tribal agencies to accomplish the um, uh, to accomplish the project, that's that's fine. Um, and it's great that you're willing to share as appropriate. And um, if I remember, I think I, I saw that in your LOI and, and that's awesome. Like as appropriate, uh, we would love to see that intent to share lessons learned. Um, so thank you for including that. And no problem, that <laughs> it was a little bit wordy. Um, let's see, would being a recipient of a previous NIDAS tribal grant resilience sorry, resilience grant affect the likelihood of success in this round. So we did not specify any eligibility criteria based on having received a grant from us previously. So no, um, the only thing that might impact 
um, funding outside of the strict scores that um, a uh, proposal receives are, and these are articulated in the NOFO, um, you know, if let's say a tribe um, put in multiple proposals and they all were very high scoring in order to distribute funds more equitably we made it we have the ability to choose to fund only one project for instance and that's a for instance um, but we did not limit eligibility based on past recipi recipients um, of our grants so that would not factor into um, um, into the decision I hope that helps and feel free to reach out for more information. Um, can you give me some examples of at least one full investigator on the project representing a federally recognized tribe? Um, yes, so I think the easiest way to demonstrate this and is, and I will send you afterwards, we shared in the first um, webinar, a web page that summarizes our existing tribal resilience, dry, tribal drought resilience grants. And so you can look at, um, most of those are led by tribes, but there are a couple that are led by a university with tribal partners. Um, so for example, we have a grant with the University of Montana um, with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe, where um, you know, the University of Montana is the primary recipient and they have um, multiple tribal partners within CK, um, CSKT. Um, and those partners include um, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, members from um, the tribal college and university, um, as well as those implementing the tribal climate adaptation plan. And so the money is coming into the University of Montana. Some of it stays there. Um, some of it has gone towards things like putting in a mesonet or weather station on the bison range on tribal lands. Um, and a lot is going to capacity building, um, training, et cetera, with the TCU and with the agencies from um, CSKT that are involved. So that's one example. Um, and they have, um, I think, two PIs from the university, a PI from another entity, a PI from an NGO, and then two PIs from the tribe. So hopefully that gives you, you know, an, one example. But I'll also um, send you the web page. And in a minute, once I stop sharing my screen, I can always. Um, try to share that web page with you as well here in the chat box. Um, just checking clarification, did you say that we could submit multiple applications? Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, you could technically, um, but what I was saying is that was just an example of if you did submit multiple applications and let's say um, those applications scored very highly, we have the ability based on uh, criteria listed within the funding opportunity to um, disseminate funds um, to projects out of rank order just to ensure some equity across geographies, um, entities, et cetera. So I was just saying that um, we do have a little bit of flexibility and this was related to the question about the, um, if you, currently are one of our recipients of our FY22 grants, could you, would that decrease your potential to get um, funding in FY24? And we did not stipulate that that would, um, that you couldn't apply in FY24 if you were a 22 recipient. So that would not impact your chances. And I was just pointing out that within the federal funding opportunity, um, there are some circumstances where we could consider going out of rank order. Um, that was my own, and I use that as an example. Awesome. Great. So I see some thank yous and some understood. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to take a minute to grab the web page with our current funded 
Tribal Drought Resilience Grants and share those with you guys so you can see um, what that last round of successful grants looked like. Give me one second. And in the meantime, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. I'm sorry, the question box. So here in the chat box is a link to our current um, our current list of grants that have been funded. And if you go all the way to the bottom of the page, you'll see FY22 Coping with Drought, Building Tribal Drought Resilience Projects. And you can explore um, some of those projects and how they built um, you know, a, a tribal, non-tribal grant teams for those that weren't tribally led. Okay, just to clarify, as a PI can, uh, so API can be a tribal official, even though they were not included in the LOI. Yes, absolutely. So again, we know that at the LOI stage, um, you know, it's, it may not be fully fleshed out. The partners may not be fully fleshed out. And so absolutely, just because someone wasn't included on the LOI doesn't mean that they can't be included in the full proposal. And in fact, that's one point of feedback that we hope will be addressed um, in the full application um, is to make sure that you have um, those tribal officials and representatives um, on the full proposal. So absolutely, you can add new partners, new PIs. Um, you can change, again, your um, budget. So all of those things are perfectly acceptable. Okay, I'm seeing a few more thank yous. Great, any other questions before we wrap up? Give it another minute. Great, I don't see any further questions. Um, I see a couple raised hands, Tim and Alice. Um, I would encourage you to throw questions in the chat box if you haven't already as that is the functionality of this particular system. I'm going to give it another second. Feel free to drop off if, um, if you are good. Again, Britt, B-R-I-T-T dot Parker at NOAA.gov. I'm happy to talk with you individually as well or answer any additional questions that come up. Okay. I'm not seeing any additional questions. So thank you so much for joining today and for your time and attention. And um, we're really excited by the letters of intent we're seeing and some of the projects you're proposing. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing your full applications and going through that process and eventually awarding grants and working with some of you um, into the future on these projects. So thank you again for your time and energy and reach out at any time in the process. And great, I see a few more thank yous and I'll be following up. So that all sounds good. Um, have a wonderful holiday season and uh, take care and best of luck in the full proposal development.